afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, the chair of the board, and I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to announce a change to today's agenda. Uh, we will be removing the agenda item of the 2021 update to the 2018 to 2022 Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan and 2022 Connectivity Criteria with the Green Mountain Care Board staff recommendations and a potential vote. So we're taking that off of the agenda and that will be put on the agenda later this month. Any questions on that? Or we're, we're good? We're good. Okay. The next item is I wanted to announce to the board and to the public that uh, the, the Green Mountain Care Board has received an extension for the Act 159 Section 4 Sustainability Reporting, Hospital Sustainability Reporting. As everyone knows, the hospitals are, un are under immense pressure from COVID, from workforce issues, from deferred care issues. So we uh, talked with the legislature, the chairs of the health, uh, House Health Care Committee, as well as the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and they've extended an extension to us until February 1st of 2022 for that reporting. Are there any questions regarding that announcement? Um, just a quick question. Um, in light of all that's happening, obviously with COVID and the incredible strain on our system, and with this additional time, does it make sense then to move our December 15th discussion of sustainability planning into January? It does. We can make that happen. I think that makes sense. Absolutely. I agree. I think it it's given everything that's going on, uh, it does make sense to push it to me as well. Okay, we will update the monthly agenda to reflect that information. Thank you all. Um, I do just want to announce that we have two ongoing special public comment periods. Um, the One Care Vermont FY22 budget and certification. Uh, we have uh, um, staff recommendations uh, will be presented next week. So we're asking that uh, public comment be submitted by today um, to be considered ahead of that presentation or by December 17th uh, to be considered ahead of the potential Green Mountain Care vote on the budget, which is tentatively scheduled for December 22nd, 2021. And then, uh, as I've mentioned several other times, we have an ongoing public comment period regarding a subsequent um, all-payer model agreement. Um, and the, that is uh, information that um, we can share with our partners on, um, on this agreement. Ian Backus, who's here with us today at AHS, as well as the governor's office as they're taking the lead on a potential subsequent agreement. And that is all I have to share today. I will turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Monday, November 22nd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Approved. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Monday, November 22nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously. And as everyone heard from Susan, um, the agenda for today has changed and we will not be taking up the HIE strategic plan and connectivity so at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Sarah Kensler, who will um, tee up the discussion for the all payer model discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB Director of Health Systems Policy, and I'm joined by um, Ina Backus. And um, Ina actually is going to introduce us, but I will uh, I will get 
the materials um, projected on the screen while she does that. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having us for this discussion this afternoon. As the board is aware, Vermont is required by the All Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement to submit a, propo a proposal for a subsequent agreement by the end of performance year four, which is the end of 2021. We're here today to recommend that Vermont propose a one year extension of the current agreement with some key modifications that reflect the implementation improvement plan that was published last year. These modifications would include um, the inclusion of fixed prospective payments made by Medicare in the all payer model agreement, just like our Medicaid program makes fixed fixed prospective payments. We would like to propose that Medicare in a one year extension make fixed prospective payments um, and provide specific guidance to critical access hospitals about how to participate in such a payment model in the prospective payment model. As a part of the extension proposal, we would also like a key modification to include uh, decoupling the Medicare investment in the Blueprint for Health and Support and Services at Home program from the ACO benchmark. Instead of running the investment through the ACO where it interacts with risk corridors, these dollars would run directly to the state of Vermont to allocate to these important population health improvement programs. A one year extension will maintain the current performance framework for the all payer model agreement. Uh, however, the modifications I just mentioned are quite significant. Our implementation improvement plan was clear that more provider payments should be converting to fixed prospective payments instead of remaining fee for service. And I know that that's been a focus of this board's discussions as well. This one year extension will allow the state to more fully engage with providers, payers, advocates and Vermonters in developing a proposal for a longer term agreement renewal, which would likely have a more typical uh, time span of five years or six years as our current agreement includes. Uh, the opportunity for this type of engagement has been limited by COVID-19. As we pursue a longer term agreement beyond the one year extension, we want to think creatively about how to maximize Medicare's participation in value based payment and in fixed perspective payment models. And while our work with the Innovation Center uh, does focus on how Medicare specifically can participate in state based models, we're also very focused on how to improve commercial payer participation in a longer term renewal. We're proposing the one year extension to run through the end of 2023. We won't be proposing one year extensions on an annual basis. This is not a proposal where we'll just look to make another one year extension proposal. Again, we would be working towards a longer term renewal proposal for a more typical uh, span of time. And today with this proposal, we're looking uh, for the board's endorsement to move forward in proposing a longer, excuse me, a one year extension to CMMI. With this proposal, we know that there will be an ensuing negotiation um, and that we will have to work with CMMI uh, to arrive at what would be a potential final agreement for a longer term, excuse me, for a one year extension. Now I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to walk through the proposal cover letter. Thank you and so I'll much. Join, I'll join you at key points. Thank you, Ina. Thank you very much. Um, so just to reiterate what um, what Ina's kind of last point. Um, 
this proposal um, that we are we are not before the board today to request um, a, approval of a one year extension that we have negotiated. We are um, asking the board to endorse starting this process. So um, to 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 put it in um, you know the simplest terms, the board and the public will both have another bite at the apple. Um, in you know when when in uh, in the event that we do propose uh, to we do request a one year extension and and we do have those negotiations with CMMI, um, this will not be the last time that we're we are before you talking about this issue. Um, we we would be back with negotiated language, which um, we would expect um, the board and the public to um, to provide uh, feedback on uh, and eventually uh, to request a board vote on that. So um, now I will walk us through the cover letter um, that staff have uh, drafted, staff from the agency as well as board staff, um, uh, which we which we are proposing to, to send to CMMI to request this. So um, the first section of the letter um, really reiterates the points that Ina has already made about why we would seek a one-year extension rather than, um, you know, proposing a longer-term subsequent agreement at this point. Um, I, I will not uh, I will not read this out loud to you, nor will I go into depth on these. But but um, we we want to build on you know the things that we have learned and the things that have you know we have learned based on the national experience as well to date. Uh, we want to ensure that we can um, thoroughly engage um, all stakeholders, including payers, providers, advocates, um, you know, Vermonters in developing a subsequent agreement proposal um, and, and COVID-19 has made that particularly challenging, um, especially for providers. Um, and, and in addition, we have, we have not been able to fully test the current model in 2020 and 2021 um, due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. So um, we, we believe that an additional year would allow us to more completely finish that test, noting that of course, um, COVID-19 has not gone away or ended and will continue to impact um, the model and, and the way that we measure um, and evaluate the model. Um, so we, in, in the materials, which um, I believe are either posted or about to be posted on our website, and my apologies to the board and the public that you may not have these at your fingertips at the moment, um, we we have included both this um, draft kind of proposed cover letter as well as um, a red line of the actual all pair model agreement so that um, so that the board and the public uh, and CMMI frankly can more easily see um, more easily see the specific changes we are proposing and and the language that we are proposing um, with the red line that we have posted is in kind of the abridged legislative format. Um, so it really focuses uh, only on the areas in which we are proposing uh, proposing changes. Um, and unless um, the board has any questions about kind of the introductory section, I will move on to describing the changes. All right, Thank hearing none. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Hearing none, um, the the we have split the revisions into um, or the kind of proposal into three um, sections. The first are technical revisions. Um, those are updates to reflect the proposed extension year, so changing dates and performance years throughout, um, as well as updates to targets. Uh, and the approach that we have taken is extending all of the performance year five targets out to a performance year six. So rather than kind of creating new targets or negotiating new targets, we're just um, recommending to extend. Uh, and that goes for total cost of care, scale, and quality and population health. Um, next, uh, we have proposed um, technical revisions to reflect the amendment that had been negotiated between CMMI and the state of Vermont in 2019 um, to update quality measure specifications to reflect updates to national measure sets uh, and to adjust some reporting deadlines to allow for more complete data and kind of reflect the, the reality of, of when we are able to produce reports based on data availability. Um, these amendments went so far as to be approved by the board, but they were never executed because uh, this happened directly before the COVID-19 public health emergency. So um, these were, uh, you know, amendments that were fully ready to go that we were never able to um, get signed because obviously our collective priorities shifted. Um, 
third, uh, we have included some updates to language around Medicare payment programs um, to reflect that you know new Medicare payment models um, have become available in the time since the agreement was negotiated and signed. Uh, and and also to note that um, CMMI is kind of phasing out the next generation ACO model as they continue to evolve their payment payment models. So we didn't want to, um, you know, have the agreement language tied to a program that um, was no longer no longer active. Um, the next generation ACO model was kind of the the new uh, the the new big path that CMMI was taking at the time that the agreement was negotiated. But at this point, you know, we we have collectively evolved. Um, so those are the technical revisions that we um, have proposed. Um, unless there are questions related to the technical revisions, I will move on to reporting. Hearing hearing none. Um, uh, so there are three changes that we are proposing here. Um, first, we are proposing to eliminate future payer differential reports, and this is because um, the there have been uh, changes to the process for developing the annual Medicare ACO uh, total cost of care benchmark um, because of COVID-19, and and that the fact that we are we have you know used retrospective benchmarks for some years and and that the benchmark process has changed just makes these reports um, significantly less useful um, and so we have we have proposed to discontinue those um, secondly we have proposed to reduce the room the number of remaining total cost of care reports um, to semi-annual uh, rather than producing them quarterly uh, because the quarterly reports have had limited utility um, and finally, we propose to eliminate the report related to um, Medicaid behavioral health and long-term services and supports and integrating that into um, total cost of care. And I'll let Ina speak a little bit more about that. In, in past um, discussions, including a town hall public forum meeting, um, we shared that uh, for it, it does not make sense um, to consider the inclusion of these Medicaid services um, for a for a um, limited extension of the current agreement. Rather, it would make sense um, to consider these in alignment with any development of a proposal for a subsequent agreement, and that these um, these things be taken together. Particularly because a proposal for a subsequent agreement would likely feature different targets um, than than we have today or potentially different targets than than we have today. And so it makes sense to think about those two things together. Thank you, Ina. Any questions about the reporting changes that are proposed? All right, um, and finally, um, we uh, we we've got a bucket which we are calling other changes, but some of these are, are some of them the bigger ticket items actually I think. Um, so firstly, as Ina mentioned, um, there's a strong desire um, in the provider community for an unreconciled FPP payment model within the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative um, and and the goals of the proposed changes are to indicate a, a collective commitment among Vermont and the federal signatories uh, to design and offer, an unreconciled FPP payment option in year six. Um, the second bullet relates to uh, to the blueprint and SASH funding, which Ina had also mentioned in her introduction. Um, this proposes to move funding um, from an advanced shared savings model to likely a single source funding opportunity for the Agency of Human Services. This is also how um, blueprint funds were moved from um, from the federal government to the state in 2017, the first year of the model. Um, and the goal here is really to um, preserve the current and historical federal investment um, in, in the blueprint and SASH um, with a reasonable annual growth rate uh, while simplifying the flow of funds and kind of moving that out of the very complicated Medicare ACO initiative benchmark um, and shared savings and losses calculations. Um, the third bullet is related to guidance uh, for critical access hospitals, which Ina also touched on. Um, we 
we continue to seek further clarification and guidance related to uh, uh, participation uh, by critical access hospitals uh, in fixed prospective payment models, including unreconciled fixed prospective payment models, and how that could potentially impact uh, their you know, cost reports uh, and, and re Medicare reimbursement model. Um, so that is also uh, something that we have included in our red line. Um, and then lastly, finally, we propose to extend the waiver of scale target enforcement through the extension year uh, that we, we received in a letter, uh, I believe in November or October. Um, and, and we've done this by proposing to remove failure to achieve scale targets as a triggering event uh, in sections six and 21 of the agreement. Um, we, the state you know, d does not propose uh, to change any of the reporting requirements included uh, in the agreement, and we would continue to report, um, you know, on scale as it is defined in the agreement, as well as reporting alternative measures of scale that Green Mountain Care Board staff have developed, uh, and which we reported in performance year three, which we think provides some some more valuable information or additional value, valuable information, I should say, about the statewide scope of the model. Um, that said, we, we just don't think that it makes sense to alter the targets at this point in the agreement um, or, or feel that that's productive. So rather than uh, rather than proposing to change the targets to something, uh, you know, that that we and the federal government agree are achievable, um, we, we would just like to continue to, to report and seek to make progress in that area. Um, and and those are the those are the proposed changes. Um, and finally, we've included a um, suggested timeline for the extension below, which kind of compares the, um, the current agreement to the suggested uh, extension timeline. And that is all. Kevin, I believe you're, you're muted. Great questions for Sarah or Ina. This is Robin. I don't have a question, but I do have a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share, but I can hold it if you'd rather take questions first. No, go ahead, Robin. OK, great. Um, I just wanted to say I I don't I personally don't see an alternative to requesting an extension, just given the bandwidth necessary to focus on COVID-19 and AHS's necessary um, need to be really laser focused on all of the issues related to COVID-19. I think I personally would rather see something very simple as described here um, in an extension and um, really then allow our collective resources to be focused on what does the next agreement look like. I think trying to do too much while we're still in the middle of a pandemic will just not be productive or uh, move us forward. Um, I also like the approach of just living with the targets. We all know there are some major challenges with the scale targets, but I can't emphasize enough, having been through this before, that re renegotiating those targets is not quick or easy. Um, and, and I don't, quite frankly, think it's worth the effort at this stage. We should just live with it, knowing that um, there are problems with them, and then we can focus our energies on what makes sense in terms of targets in the next agreement. Um, I also think that, you know, certainly I think that we have heard in the past some public comment that appears to link the idea that if we were to pull out of the all pair model, that ACOs in Vermont would go away. Uh, I don't believe that that is uh, the case. I think that's a misperception. I think um, the all pair model allows Vermont to have the ability to work with Medicare to ensure that there's alignment between Medicare and our other uh, healthcare reform initiatives in the state. Absent an agreement like we, Maryland and Pennsylvania have with the feds, uh, we would certainly see, I think, uh, additional um, Medicare only ACOs that are either regional or national in scope coming into the state. And certainly those, there's no way for the state to prohibit that since Medicare is a national program. Um, so I just wanted to make those comments about the extension. I think it's a good way to move forward. Um, and I like the approach of focusing on a couple of key things that we 
collectively recognize are important, like the Medicare participation and re unreconciled fixed payments, um, and ensuring that the medic the blueprint and SASH dollars continue to support um, are continued to be supported from Medicare. So those were my comments. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your work. Thank you, Robin. Are there other board comments or questions? Yeah, I have, I think, one quick one. I'm just, uh, in any uh, situation like this, there's two, two sides of the table um, where people were presenting our ideas and things that we want to get done. And I'm just wondering if uh, Ina or Sarah or any of the folks engaged here have any sense of any headwinds that we might hit uh, as CMMI on any of these uh, technical reporting or other issues that we're going to be presenting them. Um, I don't, I don't know of anything where we think we will get significant pushback. Um, CM, CMMI at a you know staff level obviously has indicated to us at a staff level that um, this is something that they are very open to and that they think in particular given um, given the demands of COVID-19 on all parties, um, you know, is likely uh, a I think a, a good path forward. Obviously, none of that is, uh, you know, committing committing any any of the signatories to anything. But that's kind of been the, the staff level um, consideration. I, I don't believe that any of the uh, any of the areas that we've listed here will will get significant pushback. Ina, do you disagree? I don't disagree regarding pushback. I do think that it is important for us. Um, certainly, uh, in in regards to the payment change, um, to understand that the payment change is a significant undertaking for Medicare, and that it does have technical aspects um, that are beyond the direct control of of CMMI, and um, so they, in in that regard. Again, I don't expect pushback, but I do think it's important that we are realistic that that is a very significant ask, uh, one that I think CMMI would like to explore with us, um, but it has not been done before. So I think we need to be uh, realistic that we're trailblazing here. Uh, that's absolutely right. And I, you know, our experience with the prior um, negotiation and kind of implementation of our, our current agreement um, suggested that the timeline for operationalizing major Medicare payment changes can be about 18 months. So, so we know that this is challenging. And while we are hopeful that this will will not take that long and that we'll be able to make significant progress, um, there there are uh, real barriers to, you know, to, to 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 changing changing the course of this this very big ship. So, um, we will be working, you know, closely across the two agencies and with our federal partners to assess where um, where there may be issues. We are in a much better position to request this kind of a change because we do operate and have an agreement for the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, which you're very familiar with, and that does advantage us significantly in making a request like this. Well, one reason I asked that question is that I think during the hearing with the ACO, the question was asked if uh, um, CMMI were to approve unreconcil uh, re unreconciled uh, payments today, it would take about five months just to implement the mechanics of it. And so that kind of pushes us uh, um, you know, down the road where we don't even have that approval yet. And I'm, I asked the question to make certain that people's expectations aren't that, oh, all of this is going to happen um, in this interim year because it, from just from a mechanical point of view, um, and I think Sarah was making this point, um, it can happen. The approval might happen, but getting it up and running, not so easy. Okay, hey, other board comments or questions? Yeah, I just have a, a thank you for the hard work here. And um, my question, I guess, revolves around a little bit of the timeline, understanding that timeline a little bit more. 
um, the timeline for negotiation of this proposal, how long does that take? And then assuming that this proposal or some version of this proposal is accepted by CMMI, and we do have the one-year extension, you know, uh, when, given how long it takes to plan, engage stakeholders, and negotiate a subsequent agreement, when does that next planning start, and what does that look like, if you have thought about that at all? Just trying to understand the timelines here. And Sarah, please um, uh, jump in if you see otherwise. Um, I, I think we would like to see a, an expedited exchange with CMMI regarding the proposal um, for the one-year extension so that we would negotiate on that proposal um, as soon you know, in the very near term, once it is submitted and hopefully bring that to conclusion with an agreed upon one year extension um, as soon as possible um, prior to the end of the current agreement term. Um, I, I would like to see that happen significantly before the agreement term ends um, at the end of 22. With regard to the longer term, uh, a longer term proposal. Um, I think that we um, would like to be engaging um, on that, you know, soon with the board um, as well as with the public. Um, and, you know, my expectation is for that to be occurring in early 22 you know, upon the new year. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, um, I regretfully fully support. And the reason why I regretfully fully support um, this proposal is that if I was able to not support it, it would mean that um, we would not be overrun in our hospitals with um, COVID cases and um, ICU capacity problems and things like that. But this is the reality where we had all hoped um, when the pandemic started that it it uh, would not have lasted as long as it has. And now I think we all know that we're going to be living with this for a very long period of time. And um, we have made great progress. And that's due to our healthcare professionals who have done an amazing job. And I think we have to be respectful and realize that uh, they can't be at the table right now. They have to be um, taking care of Vermonters. And so with that, uh, I fully support uh, asking for an extension of the existing agreement. Sarah, were you going to present anything else or should I open it up for public comment? We were not planning to present anything else. Um, the, the changes summarized in this cover letter really are fully reflective of all of the changes that we have um, included in the red line, um, which, by the way, is now posted on our website. Um, thank you to Kara who posted it. And again, okay. apologies that it was not posted in advance. Um, but but the, this really is comprehensive. Um, so we, we, we do not have any other planned presentation. So anyone can, um, you know, go to the website and look at the redlined agreement. Um, probably easier to follow it in the cover letter, but the redlined agreement uh, will show the changes from the existing agreement. And so uh, anyone who wishes to uh, look at that and provide us with a uh, comment may do so. Um, but at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment and see a hand raised from Susan Aronoff. Susan. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, Ina and Sarah, thank you so much for such a clear presentation and for posting the materials. I look forward to looking at them. And of course, I was really glad to see the um, Medicaid funded long term services and supports issue addressed because that's just been hanging out there and uh, so unresolved as to cause a lot of um, uncertainty in the long-term services world. My question has to do with Medicare Advantage plans and how, um, if and how uh, that's going to figure into 
the one year extension and so request. And so I haven't looked at the specific redlining. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that Vermonters with Medicare Advantage plans are not countable um, in the denominator, are not attributable <laughs> currently for the Medicare Shared Savings ACO. Can you correct me and then talk about, um, I'm sure you guys heard Vicki Lohner's testimony that somehow a Medicare Advantage plan people are going to be considered in uh, value-based plans for purposes of scale. Could you talk about that and if that's addressed at all in the one-year extension? Thank you. Thank you I was for your comment. quickly, Sarah, to see if Sarah Lindbergh was on, but I'm not sure if she is. Are you prepared to answer that? I do think I can answer that, or, or at least I can partially answer uh, and, and also kick the can a little bit to next week's uh, ACO budget staff presentation. Um, well, I didn't see she's on, so if you need to phone a friend, Sarah Lindbergh is there. I always love to phone a friend when that friend is Sarah Lindbergh. Um, so Sarah, please jump in uh, if you if you think I'm getting it wrong. And I believe Michelle Degree is also on the line, and I know that she will correct me if I uh, am wrong in any way about uh, about scale. Um, so thank you, Sue, for your comment and for your question. Um, on the first issue of um, you know how how and whether uh, Medicare Advantage um, members are attributable. Um, Medicare advanced folks with Medicare Advantage plans uh, are considered part of the commercial population rather than the Medicare population for the purposes of um, of all payer model scale. So, so rather than counting toward Medicare scale, if they were attributed, they would count toward all payer scale. They're not included in the de denominator for Medicare scale. They're included in the denominator for all payer scale. Um, that said, they're currently not attributed because none of no Medicare Advantage plan has a payer contract with One Care. So, were a Medicare Advantage plan to contract with One Care, uh, they would potentially be attributed, uh, you know, ba based on whatever the attribution methodology was for that program, as defined in you know that, that hypothetical contract. So, uh, there's some there are some steps that um, I, I think would likely need to happen in advance. Um, I in terms of uh, whether Medicare Advantage is a value-based contract, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more about Medicare Advantage and the potential role of Medicare Advantage and scale at next week's um, ACO, uh, you know, One Care Vermont FY22 ACO uh, budget and certification uh, staff presentation. So I, I think I will, uh, I'll kick the can a little bit if that's all right. And Susan Aronoff, I'm really glad you brought up uh, that because uh, I think all Vermonters are tired of seeing ad after ad for different uh, Medicare Advantage plans disguised as uh, ads for um, providing people more and more and more. And um, I think most of us on the board have some concerns about Medicare Advantage and all those ads are just one more example of money that isn't uh, going to direct care of a patient but there seems to be plenty of money to be made in the Medicare Advantage market. And so that's why uh, we're seeing all those dollars being spent. And um, I know that many people are very high on Medicare Advantage plans, and I think they do have a, a useful purpose for a number of uh, seniors, but uh, I also have grave concerns, so. Yeah, I am. Um... I share your concerns, Mr. Chair. I think one thing that's happening in the field is um, a lot of confusion for consumers as to what their choices are and what the implications of those choices are. And so, you know, it's a pretty vulnerable population. People don't always like that word, but I, I see it as a pretty vulnerable population. So anyway, um, I think any clarification as to where those plans are fitting in our whole healthcare landscape in Vermont would be helpful going forward. Because um, I think the uptake has been far greater than what people had anticipated um, at the beginning of this whole process. And I remember specifically asking about it at different times and getting the response, including from Sarah Lindbergh, that we didn't expect the uptake of Medicare Advantage to be great in Vermont. But wow, the number of options just keeps mushrooming. So 
the and landscape. It's, and it's not just changes. the scene. Who would have expected with change? This, uh, I can uh, say that uh, as a the son of parents that are uh, seniors, it's next to impossible to figure it all out. <laughs> it's very, very frustrating. So next I'll call on Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Um, I'm Jeff Tiemann with the Hospital Association. Um, first, I, I wanna start, Kevin, by thanking the Green Mountain Care Board um, for the beginning of this conversation and deciding to postpone the next sustainability discussion until January. I think as you've readily acknowledged today in a helpful way, hospitals are once again, very much in the thick of it. So focusing on the most urgent priorities is helpful for everyone and it's good for Vermonters. So thank you for that. Um, I do wanna make a comment to connect the reform work with the kind of long-term outlook for our healthcare system and also more immediately to the situation and challenges you described a little bit and that we're facing on the ground as we speak. Um, I also wanna echo your thanks to um, Sarah and Ina and everyone who was involved, including hospital CFOs in developing the bridge um, agreement proposal um, and that at the hospital association, we very much agree with the process that's been outlined here. So, you know, whether it's for a short period of time or for a long-term kind of agreement extension, I think any future iteration of the model has to ensure that the provider community can deliver the high quality care that patients expect and, and, and also continue to be a resource to communities, which um, have grown in their expectations of hospitals quite a bit in the past 22 months. So I think as the model evolves and it moves into the next iterations, it should recognize um, and I think you've alluded to this, that things have changed dramatically since we started this work. So who knew that we would get hit with a, a two year global pandemic that continues to throw us curveballs even right now, or that we would face skyrocketing and unsustainable labor costs with no end in sight. Um, who could have foreseen that our workforce shortage would become so bad, so severe, that staffing our most critical beds would be a daily challenge. Um, who thought that our hospitals would be so full some days that transferring to another facility would take hours and hours and dozens of dozens of phone calls to hospitals as far away as Connecticut? And, and finally, who would have guessed in forming the first all-payer model that hospitals would be in the inoculation and the testing business and the public health arena and that they'd have to manage COVID outbreaks and vaccine mandates and supply chain shortages all while trying to pay enough to keep their staff and meet growing patient need? So I think to, to pivot where we are today, um, as you said, Kevin, we have a record number of, of COVID hospitalizations at 85. Um, we have a small number of open ICU beds at any given time. Uh, right now, eight hospitals are reporting critical staffing shortages, inc including the Brattleboro retreat. And to manage all of this, hospitals are taking a lot of steps. There's a press conference going on right now where UVMMC is describing its effort to add ICU capacity. Similar efforts are underway at Northwestern, Southwestern, and CVMC. Other hospitals are adding or staffing up step-down capacity so we can improve throughput through the system. Um, and you also know that hospitals, some, are suspending or postponing elective procedures, which does jeopardize access, but is a daily consideration that hospitals have to make at this point. Um, and finally, they're working hard to discharge patients to the right level of care, whether that's a skilled nursing facility or a psychiatric care facility or their home. And in all of those efforts, I just really need to say that we appreciate so much the support of AHS and Secretary Smith and his team for all of these efforts. The partnership between hospitals and the state continues to be invaluable on that front. So to conclude, going forward, I, I think to manage all of these variables and continue to invest in value-based reform and, and, and care, the, the model needs to ensure that hospitals have the financial strength and staying power they need to do that and to be there for the long haul. So um, appreciate GMCB's awareness of everything that's going on and the connection to our long-term reform path um, and that we properly resource the system going forward. Thanks so much as always. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'm gonna call on Walter Carpenter. Walter. Thanks, Kevin. I just, um, Susan asked kind of the question I was thinking of, so I just wanted to reiterate that, say thanks, and also thanks to Kevin for his comments on the Medicare Advantage plans. I think you could simply call them welfare for insurance companies, um, corporate welfare. 
And but anyway, you're dead on right about those advertisements. And I hear that all the time, too. And all the confusion and the plans and that that they they don't even when you get sick, that's when you find out what's going on with those plans. Um, the direct contracting agencies as well, we should look at get rid of them. But so thanks for that. Um, I'm, Still, I want to ask an overall question that was summed up in a sentence in the um, public comment about when we submit for the extension or whatever is exactly what kind of value have Vermonters got out of one care so far. I'm paraphrasing that sentence. It was by a guy named a doctor named Dick Dundas. But I think that's a question we should ask in whether it's a one year extension or whatever. <clears throat> that's all I got, Kevin. Thank you so we're much, on, Walter. We're on the same page with the advantage plans. <laughs> <laughs> you and me. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of others. I, I think a lot of others. <laughs> OK, is there other public comment? Is there any other public comment? So, um, Sarah, do you need an official vote that's just uh, an endorsement or um, the fact that uh, people seem to be supportive? Is that sufficient enough to uh, move forward to uh, the finalization of negotiations? <laughs> That is a great question. I believe it's probably a question for Michael Barber. Um, we do have uh, votes noticed uh, for, you know, potential votes noticed for both the 15th and the 22nd. Um, hearing that, you know, it sounds like the board is, um, doesn't have major concerns. Uh, I, it seems like uh, if we do need to have a vote, uh, it may make sense to do that on the 15th um, and, and and have a public comment period probably open until um, the 13th so that whatever comment we receive by that point can be summarized and, and presented at that time. If that's okay, great. Possible. All right. So I, I want to thank you and I want to especially thank Ina. I know that uh, you're going through some challenging times. Um, your plate is very, very full and um, certainly this uptick in, in uh, hospitalizations isn't helping anybody at AHS is to uh, clear their plates to get other oh. things accomplished. So oh. um, thank you for that. And um, oh. with that, I'll ask if there is any old business to come before the board. <coughs> is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of um, adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.